In the mid to late 80s, Nintendo dominated the video game market. The NES had revitalized a dying industry and spawned copycats and competition out of every corner of the world. What made Nintendo special was its marketing and its simplicity. At every step of the way, Nintendo pushed to have its products seen as more than just gaming hardware, even if that's essentially all that it was. But Nintendo's real asset was its staff of talented and innovative developers and programmers with artistic and creative minds. With the likes of Shigeru Miyamoto, Satoru Iwata, and Hirokazu Tanaka in their ranks, it can be easy to forget some of the people who made Nintendo what they are today. Some who were, sadly, taken from this world too soon. Someone like the creative genius behind the Nintendo Game Boy. This is the story of Nintendo's first little brother console, the Game Boy, and its father, Gunpei Yokoi. During the height of World War II, on September 4, 1941, Gunpei Okoi was born in Kyoto, Japan, into the family of a wealthy pharmaceutical manufacturer. Not much is known about Gunpei's childhood, but in 1965, he graduated from Doshisha University with a degree in electronics engineering. Almost immediately upon graduation, Yokoi would be hired by Nintendo. For roughly a year, Yokoi spent his time as a repairman for Nintendo's factory. But Hiroshi Yamauchi, the president of Nintendo at the time, had a keen eye on his employees. One day, while checking in at the factory Yokoi maintained, Yamauchi noticed a strange extending hand toy Gunpei had made in his spare time at the factory. Most businessmen would probably not be happy with their employees goofing off on company time, but Yamauchi would make one of his many impactful decisions at that moment that would change the trajectory of his company. He demanded that Gunpei develop his creation into a finished product in time for the holiday season. The Ultra Hand was released that Christmas and was a huge success. Gunpei had made an impact both on his boss and the growing entertainment and toy industry. He would no longer be maintaining equipment in a factory. Instead, he would continue to make toys that would be produced in those same factories that he had worked as a repairman in just a few years prior. While toys might seem like an evergreen investment, Yamauchi was never the type to stagnate his business. In 1974, Nintendo decided to shift focus to video game development. Genyo Takeda would join the fledgling gaming division at Nintendo, and Gunpei would follow just after. One day, while traveling to work on the subway, a man messing with the buttons on his calculator to entertain himself caught Yokoi's eye. This was the moment that portable gaming became destined to change forever, but no one knew it yet. Gunpei was inspired by watching this man fiddle with an LCD calculator, and that's when he came up with the idea of creating an LCD watch display that doubled as a video game. In April of 1980, Gunpei's idea would become a reality when the Game & Watch system launched. A simple game, Ball, was paired with a simple watch all packed onto a pocket-sized LCD display and a housing shell no larger than the device that originally inspired it, a calculator. The Game & Watch was a huge success, and would continue to be produced with different games in different shapes and sizes until 1991. The Game & Watch was even responsible for the first ever D-pad. Gaming truly would not be the same without it. Yokoi would go on to work with many of Nintendo's other creators on titles for the Famicom and would have a hand in franchises like Mario and Donkey Kong. Yokoi was the one who suggested to Miyamoto that Mario have inhuman abilities like jumping from heights unharmed and smashing bricks with only his fists. Yokoi created franchises like Metroid and Kid Icarus for the Famicom, later known as the Nintendo Entertainment System outside of Japan. Yokoi was also the man responsible for hiring Masayuki Uemura, the creator of the system. Yokoi was an instrumental part of creating the infrastructure that led to Nintendo's success in gaming, but a part that often seems overlooked in the history books in favor of his contemporaries. In the late 1980s, as Nintendo was enjoying the successes of the Famicom and the NES home gaming consoles, Yokoi asked for a meeting with the man who made all of his success possible. Yokoi met with Yamauchi and presented his latest dream. 
He told Yamauchi he could create a handheld gaming device with interchangeable game cartridges, an NES on the go. A little while later, they had a working prototype, but the reaction inside of Nintendo was mixed, and that's being generous. Internally, Nintendo employees were not huge fans of the Game Boy, giving it the name of the Dame Game, or Useless Game. This almost open mockery couldn't have felt good, but it didn't seem to stop Gunpei or Yamauchi from supporting and believing in the project. Although the system was behind technologically, even by standards at the time, it was designed to be affordable and produced cheaply while being resilient and sturdy. Yokoi believed that a system that had better battery life and a more affordable price would mean success. He was right. The Game Boy was a huge success. Although media reception was mixed on release, time would see the Game Boy revered as a true marvel of the times, and remembered by kids and adults alike as some of the most innocently fun and memorable times of their lives. This little gray box with candy buttons and a dim, unlit green and black screen would kick the collective asses of all of its competition, even those with color and backlit screens. Released on April 21st, 1989, the Game Boy featured a Sharp LR35902 core CPU at 4.19 MHz with a 160 by 144 pixel LCD display. Powered by just four AA batteries that, as mentioned, lasted a pretty darn long time. While the specs didn't seem like much even in the late 1980s, the Game Boy took its owners on adventures even when they were on the go on a train, on a plane, in a car, and on the weekends that they stayed at Grandma's house, the Game Boy was a pocket-sized portal to other worlds. Super Mario Land was a short but memorable platformer that captures the spirit of Super Mario Bros. Pokemon Red and Blue was a new monster-raising RPG that had taken the world by storm and was at the height of its popularity. Kirby's Dream Land was the debut of an iconic Nintendo character. And Tetris, the pack-in title that came packaged with the Game Boy, was an instant classic. And many still prefer to play it on the Game Boy to this day. The Game Boy would see continued success through the years with a frankly insane lifespan. In 1996, seven years after its initial release, the Game Boy got its first real remodel, the Game Boy Pocket. An even smaller, more portable revision with a larger black and white screen and powered by just two AAA batteries. Just two years later, in October of 1998, the first Game Boy that supported color output was released, brilliantly named the Game Boy Color. It's debated to this day if it's truly its own console or just a refresh like the Pocket, but it did have its own exclusive games only playable on the color, so on this channel, we're giving it the distinction of being its own thing. Gifted to me for my birthday in 97, this was my first console that was, well, mine. The Game Boy Pocket I got was a red one with Pac-Man, my dad's favorite game. But it was everything to me. I had been brought up with the NES, although I was born in 1992. My experience with games at the time was pretty much exclusively the NES and arcades. I didn't have modern consoles like the PlayStation 1 or the Nintendo 64, so... Getting a Game Boy was mind-blowing to me, having access to games on the go at the same level as the NES. It was immediately obvious to my parents that this was my new obsession. Any holiday, life event, school success was celebrated with more Game Boy games. I remember acquiring Super Mario Land, Mega Man, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Toy Story, all in the time after that birthday. I have vivid memories of the day I got a school report card where all of my grades were A's and B's and my mom took me to Toys R Us to buy a new game. She even offered to buy me a Game Gear with Sonic and I turned it down because I wanted Mega Man on the Game Boy. And how could you not want more Game Boy games? If the Game Boy system is an NES on the go, the cartridges are, well, NES carts on the go. I've always loved miniature versions of things, so the Game Boy and its tiny cartridges are some of my favorite things to collect. On top of that, I'm legitimately amazed that games as big as Pokemon Gold and Silver or Zelda can fit on something this small. That may not seem impressive today compared to a Switch cartridge, but back in my younger days, I couldn't wrap my head around it. I enjoy collecting for Game Boy so much I made cassette tape cases for all of my games, and continue to anytime I add a new one to the collection. It's a nice way to store and display Game Boy cartridges, considering the games originally shipped in cardboard boxes that most people just threw away. Plus, it looks great on the shelf. A 
great way to preserve your childhood memories. One of my favorite memories is selling a bunch of my old toys in a yard sale and making just enough money to buy Pokemon Blue for myself right before a night's stay at my grandparents' house. I remember specifically the path I walked in Walmart, giving the cashiers some of the first money I had ever earned on my own, getting back to the car and ripping the game open and popping it in. I had never played an RPG before, but it didn't matter, it was Pokemon, and all of us kids were obsessed. When I found out I got to pick a starter Pokemon and didn't have to use Pikachu like in the TV show, my immediate pick was Squirtle. Still, to this day, my favorite starter. And then I remember finding out you could catch and use other Pokemon, being creeped out by my first time in Viridian Forest, the absolute joy and surprise I felt when my Squirtle started to evolve. All of this wonder, adventure, and discovery found on a tiny pocket-sized video game console. I remember I went to bed that night only to wake up at 2 a.m. and play more. Before my grandma came into the room I was in and made me go back to sleep. I also vividly remember getting a lime green Game Boy Color with Pokemon Red for Christmas in 1998. Another amazing moment, even though I didn't have any fully supported Game Boy Color games, just seeing random colors added to Pokemon made the system seem so new and cutting edge. Looking back on it now with titles such as Pokemon and Tetris, the Game Boy was destined for success. And after all of the time and work that Yokoi had put in for the Game Boy and Nintendo as a whole, he was finally seeing the fruits of his labor. But that success would also mean increased pressure moving forward. After the success of the Game Boy, Gunpei was looking for his next project to focus on. And a Massachusetts-based company, Reflection Technology Incorporated, or RTI, was looking for a partner to invest in their new creation, an early attempt at VR head tracking technology called the Private Eye. We got all the notes in here. After meetings with many of the big dogs in the industry and being turned down, RTI met with Nintendo and Yokoi. Gunpei was immediately receptive of the technology. He had found the basis for his next console. After four years of development, Gunpei's new creation, the Virtual Boy, was released. Nintendo had big expectations of anything coming from Gunpei. And unfortunately, the Virtual Boy was an almost immediate failure. Poor sales, a limited library, and bad press didn't help. To add insult to injury, or perhaps injury to insult, people complained that the Virtual Boy's all red and black display and awkward tabletop viewing stand hurt their eyes and necks, and even left them with headaches after a few minutes of gameplay. In its lifetime, the Virtual Boy failed to reach the sales goals that were set for only the first year of its release. Details about what happened between Nintendo, Yamauchi, and Yokoi after the failure of the Virtual Boy are sparse, debated, corrupted, and perhaps simply lost to time. What we do know is that Yokoi was no longer employed at Nintendo in 1996. For years, the story was that Yamauchi and Nintendo blamed Gunpei for the failure of the Virtual Boy and gave him a window seat, a Japanese business term for saying someone was given a desk and no responsibilities or projects to work on, leaving them in limbo. To make that seem even more antagonistic and hurtful, there are also stories that Gunpei actually didn't want to release the Virtual Boy in its current state at the time, but was rather forced to. It's really impossible to know what's true. My personal opinion is that Yamauchi did often come off as an incredibly shrewd businessman. Many of the stories you hear about him from people who worked with him always make it sound like they were almost terrified to have meetings with him. For that reason, in my mind, it's not hard to think that Yamauchi may have had some harsh words for Yokoi about the failure and punished him for it. But we'll never really know. According to Yokoi, in a posthumously released article, he had actually planned to retire around the time he left Nintendo regardless of the Virtual Boy's success. So perhaps the dramatized version that he was essentially ostracized and forced out is just that, a dramatization. Or maybe Yokoi really was shamed and ostracized inside of the company and was just trying to correct the books in a way that seemed in his power. Regardless of the reason why, leaving Nintendo wouldn't mean Yokoi's departure from the video game industry. He would go on to create a company called Kodo, help to develop the classic keychain accessory game, the Tamagotchi, and eventually make new handheld gaming devices like the Wonderswan for Bandai. His legacy lived on behind his stay at Nintendo, who is still producing new versions of the Game Boy, the Game & Watch, and of course, new games in his franchises like Metroid and Kid Icarus. 
Not to mention the fact that every game console I can think of to this day has released with some form of Goonpei's creation, the D-pad. Nintendo even lives by his philosophy of making more affordable, more fun games to this day. On October 4th, 1997, Gunpei and his associate, Atsuo Kiso, were driving down the Hokuriku Expressway in Japan, when Kiso accidentally rear-ended a pickup truck in front of them. Kiso and Yokoi attempted to exit to check the damages on each vehicle and the occupants of the truck. While they exited, a third passerby vehicle struck the two men. Both were transported to a nearby hospital. Atsuo sustained a fractured rib. Gunpei Okoi passed on two hours later. He was 56 years old. Yokoi was and is remembered by his friends, co-workers, and colleagues as a true innovator, not just in video games, but in life. He was a brilliant engineer, a fantastic toy designer, an excellent programmer, and when it came to making video game consoles, he thought outside of the box by limiting himself to what was available in the box already. It's hard to think of a world without the Game Boy and even harder to imagine what modern gaming would be like without the innovations of this one man. A man who was taken far too soon, but whose impact cannot be overstated. We owe modern gaming to Gunpei Yokoi. The Game Boy line would see a few more releases under its belt after Yokoi's departure. In 2001, the Game Boy Advance was released, capable of playing all of the previous Game Boy libraries as well as its own 32-bit game cartridges. Two years later, a foldable revision of the GBA, the GBA SP, harkened back to the folding designs of the Game & Watch. And later, a super tiny revision of the GBA, the GBA Micro, was released, though it could only play GBA games. In 2003, at the Game Developer's Choice Awards, Yokoi was posthumously awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award. His family was there to accept in his stead. When presenting the award, Yuji Naka of Sega and Sonic Team stated, To have a life's work recognized by other game creators is the most meaningful honor one could receive. Well, we've talked a little bit about the Game Boy and a lot about the man who made it so successful, so why don't we delve a little bit more into the consoles, its games, and its legacy. The Game Boy, Game Boy Pocket, and Game Boy Color are things any 90s kid can tell you tons about. I've already discussed how the Game Boy and Game Boy Pocket are more or less the same consoles, just with some differences in display visibility, size, and power sources. But did you know there was another Game Boy Pocket? The Game Boy Light has almost no telltale signs that it's any different from a normal Pocket, but this was the first Game Boy to have a lit screen. Unfortunately, this model never made it out of Japan, and it's a real head-scratcher as to why they didn't push this globally. The Game Boy Color sported a slightly larger shell with a curved back that may or may not have subconsciously developed the tastes of many a preteen boy. It was powered by two AA batteries and supported full-color games, making it really feel like an NES on the go. But it would also add colors to your old Game Boy games from a selection of preset palettes, which can be accessed with a number of different button combinations held at the Game Boy logo upon startup. Out of all these classic consoles, I have to say my favorite of the classic Game Boy designs is the original DMG. Maybe it's because I'm an adult with monster hands now, but it's the one that fits in my hands best, not to mention they have the most real estate to customize and mod. More on that later. The DMG has this rugged brick-like design. They feel like you can throw them at a wall and they'll still work. In fact, one survived a bombing, so that tells you how well these things are built. The Game Boy Pocket has a lot of nostalgia for me, and it was my first Game Boy. I really appreciate the screens on these things and the overall form factor truly lived up to its name. This thing fits in your pocket. Even my super skinny emo jeans that I refuse to give up even in my 30s. The Game Boy Color is much the same. I appreciate the color screens and the ability to add color to original Game Boy games, but this was the first time I ever saw hardware failure in a video game system. 
My start button on my original Kiwi Green Game Boy Color had issues, and even the ones I mod today have the same issue, with seemingly no real fixes. I do enjoy the curved battery door though, that feels great in the hands. Combined, the Game Boy, Pocket, and Color sold almost 119 million units, making it the fourth best-selling video game console of all time. The Game Boy Advance, GBA SP, and GBA Micro were the next step up and, to me, feel like the first true advancement of the Game Boy line. The graphics were a huge step up, feeling like a portable Super Nintendo, and it even pulled off some impressive 3D games as well. The form factor on the original GBA switched from a vertical orientation to a horizontal one. The GBA SP would revert this in a way, but only because it had a foldable shell making it even more portable and safe. With the folding design, most of the buttons in the screen were protected from damage while in your pocket. The Micro? I'll be honest, I don't know what they were thinking with this thing. What is this, a Game Boy for ants? It's too small, strips away backwards compatibility, and it hurts my hands and eyes. A fun personal story about the Game Boy Advance. My first GBA was the Glacier Edition. I took it to school with me all the time, and my friend Evan and I would play Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire at recess all the time. My recess was at the end of the day most days, so my mom would pick me up straight out of recess. One day, I hurriedly shoved my GBA into my pocket when she arrived. When I got home and took it out, the screen had been scratched to kingdom come by some coins in my pocket. I was heartbroken, near tears, so my mom called Nintendo to see if they could fix it. The Nintendo operator offered to send us a box and a label to have it shipped to them for repair free of charge. That's service. I'm sure this guy was clearly thinking, poor kid, throw him a bone, after my mom explained to him what had happened. It was a sad moment turned into a happy moment, all thanks to the kindness of a guy on the phone at Nintendo HQ. However, I'm also realizing now that this was the moment I developed an OCD for scratches on screens, I can't stand it. Anytime a screen is scratched, I must fix it or replace it. Anyway, when my GBA finally got back, they had packed in some fun Nintendo stickers too. A few years later, I upgraded to the 101 SP that was my last Nintendo console for a really long time. To be honest, I don't have a lot of memories with the SP. It was great to have a backlit screen that I could play all of my Game Boy games on, but I didn't really play many GBA games. At the time, the PlayStation 2 was my go-to console. My GBA experiences were mostly limited to Pokemon and Mega Man Battle Network. If you've seen my PSP video, you know I eventually traded all of this in for a PSP. So I won't bore you with that story again, you can watch that video if you want to. Obviously, there are tons of memories I could share about the Game Boy, but we'd be here all day. And I'd rather talk about my memories with some of those specific games in their own videos later down the line. So instead, let's talk about my favorite thing about the Game Boy and its community today. The modding scene that is not only keeping the systems alive by repairing them, but also pushing them further into the future than I ever thought possible. Yes, the modding scene for every Game Boy system is insane today. Just a few years ago, the mods were mostly limited to adding lights to the screens through rather complicated and dangerous methods. But today, there are kits that make things like installing backlights, pro sound, and rechargeable batteries so easy, even a caveman could do it. No, but really, I am not the most delicate repairman on the scene. I'm quite clumsy and I shouldn't be allowed around heavy machinery, but thanks to the multiple internet guides, YouTube tutorials by channels like Macho Nacho, and a book written by a prolific Game Boy modder, I consider myself a decent handheld modder. I've repaired and modified dozens of Game Boy systems of all types, and they're only getting easier to do. Most kits for backlit screens now simply require removing the original screen and replacing it with a new one and soldering a couple of points on the PCB. Super easy with a steady hand. Same with sound mods, putting new speakers on is as easy as soldering two points. Some of the DMG kits even replace the original PCB with a new one, making drop-in mods even easier. And up until recently, I've stayed away from rechargeable battery mods, but now those are literally just as easy to install as it is to put in new batteries into the console. They even make pre-molded battery covers to allow for a USB-C charger to plug into. It's incredible. 
Some of the more intense mods still require skill and I haven't attempted them myself. But I have seen people do everything from installing a whole Game Boy Color into the shell of a Game Boy Pocket, to replacing the D-pad with an analog stick, truly this scene is constantly pushing the limits of what can be done to a Game Boy. I've never seen a more enthusiastic console modding community, and I think that tells you just how great the Game Boy and its software library really is. People want to play these games on the original hardware, even if it means making it a little more modern for comfort's sake. Not to mention, there's a growing homebrew scene of indie developers making brand new Game Boy games that run on original hardware, and some of them are even publishing physical carts for their titles. Gunpei Yokoi's system is probably going to live forever at this rate. And now, we're finally getting classic Game Boy games on the Nintendo Switch's online service. Mr. Yokoi may be gone, Nintendo may have abandoned the Game Boy hardware and namesake, and we may never see another system from Nintendo truly dedicated to just portable gaming ever again. But I don't think we have anything to worry about. The legacy of the Game Boy and Mr. Yokoi speaks for itself. The beliefs and philosophy of Gunpei still echo in the halls and hearts of Nintendo and its staff. And that's something I hope he would be very proud of. That's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, it's Jonathan here, or Johnny Com, whichever you prefer. I'm the guy that makes these videos, and I'd really just like to say that this video drove me crazy. Adobe Premiere drove me crazy. It kept crashing and this video would have been out sooner had that not kept happening. But it kind of worked out because the date that I published this is obviously kind of an important date in, uh, in the history of the Game Boy. And I really hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, I just wanted to say that I have a whole bunch of social medias and I have opened up a Patreon. Now there's not really anything on there right now and I can't guarantee that there will be. I just figured I'd go ahead and set it up in case I came up with plans in the future or if anybody wanted to support me. Again, you're absolutely not obligated to. I have a real job, but if you want to support me in some kind of way and just let me know that, hey, you really want to see something, um, it's there. There's a Patreon there and it's linked on my profile. So, um... Yeah, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'm already working on the next one, and I'll see you next time.